New Brunswick's Fundy Shore has spawned its share of careers and characters, but few, if any, can compare with the man myth who came into the world in this small house at Tynemouth Creek in 1872. He was Edgar Parker, a precocious child, failed seminarian, sailor, clerk, salesman, musician, the archetype of the frontier dental practitioner. He was painless Parker. Graduated from dental college in Philadelphia at a time when dentistry was almost synonymous with witch doctory, he abandoned his dentist chair in the St. Martin barber shop to take dentistry to the people. He used brass bands, trapeze artists, high wire acts, chorus girls, and a wagon. He roamed the country, a step ahead of the law, practiced in the gold fields of Alaska and the Klondike Gold Rush. He set up chains of offices in New York and California, made and spent a billion dollars in his time, died in relative obscurity, hating the profession he tried to promote and reviled by that very profession. To this day, organized dentistry regards Painless Parker as a shyster, pure and simple. But he's not without his defenders, few as they may be. Foremost among them is this man. Dr. Peter Pronich is a teacher at the Dalhousie School of Dentistry in Halifax. Pronich has spent years researching Parker's career. He's written articles about him and defended Parker's reputation in the high councils of the North American profession. Pronich sees a man ahead of his time with an interest in demystifying dentistry, educating the public, and purging dental practice of its legacy of pain and fear. Uh, he was always uh, one to try to help out the patient uh, he was uh, not only the person who, who tried to invent something to numb the pain of dental treatment, but when it became uh, readily available to a dental profession to use anesthetic, he was first uh, on the, uh, in line to get it and use it. At the turn of the century, the noise of a brass band was deemed demeaning to dentistry. Today, a refined version is widely used under the name of audio analgesia. That means that you get some numbing of the pain through the, uh, the hearing. And he started off with a very crude method using his band to, to disorganize the patient, to uh, confuse them. Parker also made dentistry a business, and he made the office a business place, an efficient one at that, with as many as three chairs per dentist. The small, discreet dental parlor wasn't part of his style, and it's a uh, style that has become uh, fashionable these days. That, he he really took dentistry out of the office and took it into a high profile, high um, traffic areas. And right now we can see uh, dental clinics sh uh, springing up in shopping centers. And this was done by Painless Parker a long time ago. All of those approaches were unorthodox for their time. It was his style and the lingering reputation as a theatrical act which put him in direct conflict with the profession. He was seen as an embarrassment, and it was not marked in his favor that he was one of the first preachers of dental health in North America. He was a man with a message, and the message was, look after your teeth. It was in San Francisco that Painless Parker became as settled as he ever would be. California passed a law stipulating that dentists should practice under their legal names, and he changed his legal name to Painless. The profession seemed to have won in 1929 when his license was revoked. He simply hired more dentists to run his clinic. He became a business manager and promoter, and the promotion remained unorthodox. Oh, the money kept rolling in. Painless Parker owned a mansion and a yacht, which he raced to Tahiti, and he made and lost a fortune. In the late 40s, his license was reinstated, and he retired to a conventional practice in this building in San Francisco. By the time he died at 80 years of age, he was a legend in his own time, still considered an embarrassment to dentistry. This is one of the last pictures of Painless Parker, taken six months before his death. The stovepipe hat was riddled with bullet holes it picked up in the gold fields. The necklace contains more than 350 teeth, all of them extracted on one day, when business was booming, a personal record. But he died alone and bitter. It was organized dentistry, and they were always against him. Yeah. And it started right back at the time when he left New Brunswick. He was almost driven out by the dentist. Painless Parker's personal story ended in San Francisco in 1952 when he died. But the legend that was born here is certainly alive and well. The debate even rages on today. Was he a charlatan and a snake oil salesman? 
Or was he a dedicated practitioner who was a century ahead of his time? And that's a question that may not be answered in our time. But there is one thing about which there can be no question. Edgar Painless Parker was one of a kind. Neil Stairs, CBC News, Tynemouth Creek. and Tina Srobotniak. What's one of the most mistrusted phrases around? This won't hurt a bit. That's it. For a 19th century Canadian dentist, it was actually true, almost. We'll hear about Painless Parker. Painless would parade in front of the patient, would reach up into the sleeve of his jacket where he had a pouch that held his extraction forceps. Uh, he would come around the patient, he would wave his hand, his other hand around, and then very sharply thump the patient in the chest. Well, we'll hear about Painless Parker right after the midday news. Painless Parker. Now, we talked about him a couple of days ago. We, uh, we are going to talk about, he is a 19th, was a 19th century dentist. He operated on the back of a, of a wagon, really. He'd go around, he'd yank your tooth out for 50 cents. And he's from New Brunswick. Your hometown. And in a moment, we'll hear about Painless Parker, a 19th century dentist with lots of chutzpah. I'm Peter Pronich, and in a couple of minutes, I'll be right back to tell you about Painless Parker, the dentist who made a circus out of pulling teeth. This Christmas. Those are pictures of Painless Parker, a dentist who pulled teeth in a razzmatazz traveling road show at the turn of the century. And yes, that was a necklace of human teeth. 357 of them, which Painless pulled in one day's work at a fair. He was originally from New Brunswick. He toured across Canada and through the States pulling teeth. Peter Pronich has co-written, or maybe co-edited is a better term, a book about Painless Parker. He's at the dentistry school at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Hi there, Dr. Pronich. Hi, Tino. So edited is, is, is more the word, isn't it? Because this is actually the, the sort of the journals of Painless Parker himself. That's correct. Now tell me, how did you, get, how did you fall in love with this guy? Well, my name is Pronich, and my first injection, I did it so nicely that the patient called me Painless. And uh, I had to do a paper on ethics in dentistry. And what better person to do it on than Painless Parker? You know, uh, Painless Parker was a complete revelation to me. I'd never heard of this guy. And when I looked at it, I thought, oh, well, you know, American. But that turns out this is a small town boy from New Brunswick. Now, how did a small town boy from New Brunswick come to be this, you know, this almost circus performer, Painless Parker? Well, very early in his career, he ran away from the Baptist Seminary in St. Martin's where he was being trained to become a Baptist preacher. And he became a pot and pan salesman in Moncton. Mm -hmm. And he found he loved that so much that he wanted to be a salesman all his life. And until the time of his death, he sold uh, dentistry, very much like he would have sold pots and pans. He just yeah. loved it. He, because he says in the book that what, what he got from religion was the sense that you could really move people by, you know, that, that if you got a spiel down in 30 minutes, you, you could really convince people to do things. Well, he was telling people that they would have tremendous toothaches and bad problems with their teeth uh, if they didn't have their teeth looked after. Mm -hmm. And he encouraged them to do so by offering to take out their teeth for 50 cents and then would pay anybody $5 if they would take and feel any type of pain at his hands. So give us, a, give us a description of what this was like. I mean, he had a flatbed truck that he would go out in, right? M much like any of these guys that you'd see roaming the country. That was later in his New York days, but during the days in New Brunswick, he worked off the back of a flatbed wagon with a barber's chair on it. He would position a barber chair in the center of that wagon and then proceed to have his little Dixieland band uh, attract the crowds uh, they were godly dressed in their red and white striped jackets and their straw hats. He would have a brace drum, a coronet, and he would have a banjo player. These were props that he used to attract the people, and these was, were the same props that he used to take and drowned out the screaming of the people that uh, he t extracted teeth from. <laughs> but I thought he was painless, Dr. Pronage. Well, he was painless, and this was part of his marketing. His image was to take and make everybody think he was painless. In actual fact, he did use a very early uh, painkiller called hydrocaine, which he and his pharmacist 
in St. Martin's concocted. Is this the predecessor to Novocaine? Is this that what is a, he had? Yes, it was. He had read in a dental journal some time ago of uh, this new painkiller that you could inject into people's gums. Before mm -hmm. that, it was only laughing gas and general anesthesia that was available to deaden the pain. But this uh, uh, local anesthetic, the forerunner of uh, Novocaine or Xylocaine or any of the other anesthetics that are used now, um, was basically made out of co uh, cocaine. And so, you put so it into a syringe and you inject it into the gums. Now describe the, describe the process of taking someone's, because uh, I know he had the bands, you know, playing and all that stuff. Take me through an extraction. Okay, what he would do is he would uh, associate himself with the country fairs. And uh, on this wagon, flatbed wagon that he had established, uh, he would attract the crowds, as I said earlier, with the Dixieland band. Um, he would uh, have the band play for, oh, about five or ten minutes, and then he would make an eloquent entrance onto the stage. Uh, he'd be dressed in a beaver hat, and he had godly colored clothes, and he wore spats, but he always had a white clinic jacket on. Mm -hmm. uh, he would get up on the stage, the band would introduce him, he would parade around with arms waving and pointing in the air and talking to people about the virtues of good dental care. And then he would look around at the uh, crowd and uh, take and select a person that he would like to extract a tooth from. If that person didn't want to come forth, he would then urge the crowd to push him forward. So the crowd very willingly pushed this person to the stage he would grab the person, put him in a gentle chair, and then the band would position themselves around the patient. The bass drum was usually at the head of the patient, the coronet was on one side, and the banjo was on the other side. Boy, that sounds relaxing. It was very relaxing because it worked all the time. <laughs> now, what happened is that he took, and at the appropriate time, would signal with his hand to the band. They would play the loudest music you could imagine. After about a minute or two, the patient would be totally disoriented and confused. At that time, Painless would parade in front of the patient, would reach up into the sleeve of his jacket where he had a pouch that held his extraction forceps. Uh, he would come around the patient, he would wave his hand, his other hand around, and then very sharply thump the patient in the chest. And what did that do? Thumping well, the patient it did in the two chest. things. It opened uh, the patient's mouth and it drove all the air out of the lungs. And so they couldn't the, scream, you mean? And so they couldn't scream. You can't <laughs> scream when you're inhaling. <laughs> so what he did then was he popped his forceps in very quickly into the patient's mouth and grabbed hold of the tooth, which hopefully was loose, Right. and then pulled it out. Uh, the band Ew. continued to play, uh, so they masked any moaning that might come from the patient. You know, I mean, he was a wild success. He went on to become a millionaire. He started a whole, I guess, a series of clinics in the United States. Oh, eventually Penis. he went on to have 37 dental clinics in the United States. And he was the, the manager of these clinics. And uh, he became a mil millionaire in the 1920s. And but, he, but he always had trouble with what he called the ethicals, didn't he? Oh, they plagued them all the time. Now, they would what, set him up. Who were the ethicals? The ethicals were the traditional dentists who felt that what Painless Parker and others were doing was belittling dentistry. It was not uh, in a professional way that uh, he was treating dentistry. Uh, he fe uh, they felt that uh, he was unethical. He felt that uh, he was performing dentistry uh, in a situation that really wasn't where dentistry should be mm -hmm. performed because they said it was uh, not sterile and it was outdoors and it was be belittling to the profession. Mm. Well, it's an interesting story. Is he your role model, Dr. Pronich, or may well, I call you Painless? <laughs> I, I like to think that. I think Painless Parker is in each and every one of us. Yeah. We all see ourselves wanting to do what Painless Parker did, but not having the intestinal fortitude to do so. Well, I like your tie. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's been, it's, this is obviously, uh, you know, a work of... It's been fun reading about it. As I say, a Canadian I'd never heard of. Thanks very much, Dr. Well, Pronich. Well, you're very, very welcome, Tina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.